You're welcome to First Take. My name is Jifa Bampo. Today we are engaging with the new CEO of Afrobarometer. Many of you may have seen their surveys or have even been polled. They undertake research on various issues relating to politics, economics, and social development. We'll be bringing you that conversation shortly. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us on First Take. So today I'm taking your first take on various issues relating to you, your work, and Afrobarometer. So how's it been going? Congratulations on your appointment as a CEO of Afrobarometer. What's your feeling? I mean, you're stepping into the big shoes of Professor Jima Bwedu, who'd been in the role for, what, almost a decade or more? He's been there for two decades. He started mm -hmm. off in 1999, and so it's a little over two decades mm -hmm. now. And I think in some ways, stepping into his shoe, as you rightly point out, is their big shoes, for sure. When I came into this role, I knew that he was going to give me shoes that would fit me well. And I say so because he's the kindest person I know. And not surprisingly, he did give me a shoe that actually fitted me well. In terms of replacing him, as you know, Jifa, as several Ghanaians will tell you, this guy is a legend. I mean, if you talk of African democratization and activism about democratic development on the African continent, I doubt that any name will come on top beyond uh, Jima Bwedi. And so I see him as a legend. He's an irreplaceable person. But my intention is over time, hopefully I'll grow gradually into his shoe and maybe one day I'll become like him. But I don't, I'm not going to pretend to be him. Certainly, I know that. But I recall interviewing you almost a decade ago when you were the CDD programs officer and the Afrobarometer data manager. And then you disappeared a bit. Later, I found out that you were teaching at uh, UCLA, and then you worked with the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Right. So was it always the plan that eventually you would come back? Because not many people like you who go tend to come back. Uh -huh. Yes. So I think for me, I knew that I was going to come back to Ghana, that I was going to come back and work on the Afrobarometer, but I wasn't sure in what capacity. So I started off as a data manager for the project so in 2008, thereabouts. I think that was the time I spoke with you. Mm -hmm. At that time, I used to work more closely with CDD, and so it was a research about you know, public resource leakage in the education sector. And when I went to graduate school, my intention was to come back this way at some point. The question was when, I wasn't sure. But of course, I always knew that Jim Abwedi, being who he is, is somebody I would like to mimic going forward. And I think the Afrobarometer does provide an opportunity for me to live my childhood dream. And why do I say so? Um, growing up in the northern part of the country, specifically Zwarangu, my hometown, government seemed so distant from people. I used to sit in the village and I would hear the information services van come driving through the village with a lot of information about what government wanted us to hear. But there was no opportunity for us to tell government what we felt what we experienced. And so I felt if I grow up, that is one of the things I hope to change, that I would make sure that people have the opportunity to speak to their government. And working on the Afrobarometer does give me the opportunity to fulfill that childhood dream. Mm. And that's certainly why I wanted to come back and work on the Afrobarometer. Research in Africa is difficult. Gathering data and, you know, connecting it to the pressure points can be challenging. As you look at all the work Afrobarometer has done, would you say that you've done a, you know, made a good stride in trying to overcome those unique challenges of research in Africa? Right, so when this project started in 1999, I mean, nobody thought that you could do public opinion polling in Africa. I mean, people thought, Africans are generally about looking for their livelihoods, the economic issues. Nobody thought about the fact that there'll be anything close to having a nationally representative survey on the continent. There used to be some surveys, maybe few surveys here and there. Sometimes media outlets would do some surveys of people and some development NGOs would come and do surveys in some villages in order to inform their programming. 
But when we started in 1999, that was not there. And it's a tricky business to do surveys on the continent. And you know, doing such surveys is intensive. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of resources. But that is the only way you can really get to know what people experience. And walking to people's homes, sitting with them, talking for almost an hour about the economy, politics, governance, issues that affect them. I think it does two things. One, it does pro provide people the opportunity to tell government what they feel, what they experience. But it also allows us to say, if governments are investing in development, if international NGOs are investing in development, if development part partners are investing in development, how does it reflect in people's lives? Because our hope is that whatever we do at a national level in terms of public policy, development, implementation, that it will impact people's lives. The question is, does it really impact their lives? And the Afrobarometer research allows us to. You come to Ghana at a really auspicious time in our governance, 28 years since uh, our democratic, I don't know why we call it experiment, but... We still, ex we still experiment, because the United States has been there for more than 200 years, and they're still experimenting. And it's interesting, in just the previous comment you made, you talk about what the impact has been and whether people really feel the development in their lives. How can you explain to people that this democratic experiment we're on remains worthwhile 28 years after the fact? Right, so let me just start by saying, one, the feeling that democracy is on the decline globally is very valid. There is no question about that. But we need to make a distinction between the demand side for democracy and the supply side for democracy. Now, when you look, when talk about the demand side, that is, what do people want? What do they expect? What are they experiencing in terms of governance and democracy? And for all our surveys across the 30 plus countries we've worked in, Africans overwhelmingly are in support of democracy. They want to see democracy in their countries, and they are even demanding for even deeper forms of democracy that is accountable governance. And so when it comes to the people themselves, Africans and Ghanaians for that matter are Democrats, that governments are responsive and accountable to the people, that parliaments play their oversight role well, that the media holds the president accountable, that the judiciary is able to do his work and that even if the president doesn't agree with the decisions of the court, he has to abide by those rules and that presidents should accept term limits. So this is all coming from the people and so Africans are deeply democratic and democracy is actually growing among the people. The challenge we have is the supply side. When you say the supply side, that what is, is that? now the elected leader supplying what the people are expecting. And so I think, see it more as a leadership failure, that our leaders are unable to meet the demands of the people. And so overall, democracy, I would say, is not on the decline. It's a failure of leadership. Our leaders are not just able to meet the extent of democratic demand that is on the continent and that is in Ghana today. So. You talk about the supply side. What exactly do you mean by that? So the supply side, what I mean is uh, elected leaders. Like elected leaders are really not able to supply and meet the demands and aspirations of the people. And so it is just the failure of our leaders to supply the kind of democracy that people are yearning for. And that, I think, is a leadership gap and the decline in democracy, the blame lies with the leaders and not with the people. I think it must be interesting to have 20 years of data to do a trend analysis and show what the trajectory is. So for Ghana, what can you tell us? That would be great. I mean, so for Ghana, what we are observing is, first of all, of course, we started off with people really wanting democracy. They support democracy. They reject all forms of you know, non-democratic rule, whether it is one-party rule, one-man rule, or military rule. They reject all those forms, overwhelming majorities. They want democracy. But over time, even though the support for democracy, we've seen it to actually be declining. I support for democracy as democracy seems to be declining. But what we are observing is that people are now demanding, as I mentioned earlier, accountable governance. So it's not just democracy they want. They want a democracy in which leaders are accountable, are responsive. And so you've, we've seen an uptick in the demand for accountable governance. So we've put uh, two questions to Ghanaians to ask them, 
do you prefer an accountable government that is not very effective in delivering, or you want an effective government that is not really delivering to delivering well? I mean, that is really delivering well, but it's not accountable. And they choose the latter, the former, because Ghanaians want a government that is accountable in the first place, and not just one that is effective in delivering and not being accountable. And that tells us that there's a deeper sense of expectations of what democracy can do. In terms of our performance, over time, the same thing, the same sort of satisfaction with democracy, and <clears throat> People's thinking of whether or not Ghana is a democracy. We've seen it, you know, gone up and down, and it seemed to be on a downward trajectory. That people are not satisfied with the way democracy works, and they don't think that Ghana is a full democracy. There, there are some people who've sought to suggest that probably democracy is not good for Ghana because there are issues relating to development that become partisan. And so if we had someone who had just the interest of Ghanaians, the national interest, not the interest of a political party or political patronage, probably we will have the benefits we are looking for delivered. What do you think? And that is the, I think that is exactly what Ghanaians are rejecting from our data. Because mm. people would rather prefer an accountable government they prefer to an accountable just government. An, an effective government. government. Because there are, there, there's a, a lot of I mean, a pride in Ghanaians to feel that they have leaders who respect them and treat them with dignity and that even if they are not effective and I know that my government tells me exactly how much resources they get, how it is spent, and even if that spending doesn't really deliver on what I'm expecting, the thinking is that you have been doing exactly what I want you to do and I expect you to do. And if all the branches of government play their role, and I think that is exactly what Ghanaians are hoping for, not necessarily an effective government. And remember, they don't want any autocratic governments. Mm. But I guess the question then is, are leaders accountable? Well, you tell me about it. That, that's a, the challenge you know, most Ghanaians have expressed to us when we ask them in our service. I mean, we know that the Public Accounts Committee oversees a lot of, you know, uh, audited reports. Right. There's been a recent um, compilation of data that we lose as much as 11 billion through procurement malfeasance. And then there's a view that even when Ghanaians are unhappy about issues, yeah, our leaders can't be bothered. And that has a myriad of challenges. The question is why are our leaders not being responsive and accountable to the people? I think it does, I mean, it boils down to, I mean, in the biggest scheme of things, it's all about our constitutional design. You know, I'm not a constitutionalist, but I totally understand why people would say so. But then, for me, when I just look at it from the personal experience, you would realize that the way our political parties are run is partly to blame. Because we have a political party system that practice, does not practice democracy internally. And yet we expect an institution that is non-democratic to emerge and lead a country and rule as a democracy. That is not going to be feasible because the kinds of processes that take place within the political party to bring out leaders who would represent the political party does not reflect the values of democracy. Really? They do go to elections. Um, the NPP, for instance, has the enviable record of trying to expand the access to determine who becomes a flag bearer. They do that really from the constituency to the, to the regional, to the national level. Right. And I tell me, I do think they all tried, they both big parties tried this, and they have rolled back that because they want to get it back to a point where they can control who gets into determining who actually represents the party. And I think that is where the challenge is. Because if I'm a party member, I can't bear a member of a political party. I want to be able to vote for who represents me. But if there's a gatekeeping process where I cannot be the one influencing it, but that somebody who serves as a delegate on my behalf is the one that goes to deliver the vote. The question is, if I have three delegates from my constituency, what are the chances that these guys will get bought off? 
And I think that's where the challenge is. And I say it is undemocratic because you have party members that do not contribute to determining who leads the party. And then you leave it to people who can provide the highest pay. So, finan so financing leads to political patronage, creating a certain environment that the parties try to determine who eventually leads them. And that is where the challenge, the challenge comes in when it comes to accountability, because the question is then who do you account to? If I'm able to buy my way into a political office, am I really accountable to somebody? Or are the people I bought off supposed to be accountable to me? And so when you have this dynamic happening in our political parties, and I'm hopeful that, I mean, at some point, we would have some reforms that look into more deeply. I think the two major parties tried to shift in that direction when it came to um, nominating members of parliament, candidates for members of parliament. They have, from time to time, opened it up, and then I've seen that now they've both closed it up again. So, so in some constituencies, it's open, but in others, they, they restrict it. They say, oh, this constituency is we are not having anybody contesting the sitting MP. That's what you're, you're kind of referring to. And does that sound democratic? That's mm -hmm. a question, because mm -hmm. it is, if you want to practice democracy, you should leave it out to the people to decide. Let's talk about some current issues that have been, you know, uh, plaguing our society for a bit. And one is the area of local governance. First, your thoughts about, you know, the whole buhaha relating to the MMDC appointments and nominations. Yeah, it's, it's good that you brought this, up this topic. I think this topic has been one of the topics at the top of my mind when it comes to Ghanaian democratic development, especially when it comes to service delivery. That's my own area of research. You know, decentralization, we've all agreed, is a way to go if you want to bring governments closer to people. If you decentralize, you want the local people to have control. And how do you make them have control? Get, let them to have the opportunity to choose who leads them. The unfortunate thing, and as you rightly pointed out, we go through an appointment process. And the delay in the appointment, in my view, I know people have said it's probably a strategy by the president to signal that you know, this is why I said we should elect them. But I think it's just a difficult process. Uh, that is selecting, to, selecting who, should, who should be nominated to these MMDC positions. Correct. Because you have the president sitting in Accra and having a myriad of issues to deal with. And now you want him to determine the person who would lead the people in my community. And this is a faraway community, Zwarungu, the Bulga East District. It is, it is very difficult for the president to know that. Of course, the political party exists there and they may be able to identify who to lead. But it's not always the case that there's uniformity in terms of who should lead. And some people may have factions. And so just the, the mechanics or the logistics of determining who should be nominated is difficult. And I'm not surprised that it took so long for him to get, get to the point. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at the reaction generally? Because it's almost as if the party anticipated it and the government. But the expectation was that people had different preferences. And so maybe there were some factions who wanted some people and other factions who wanted other people to be nominated. And I think it all boils down to seeing public office in Ghana these days as opportunity to make money. And so there's this sense of once you get into public office, that's the fastest way to make money. But is that fair to say? I mean, I, I, he, I, know, I, I know that's a lot of the view, but I was also surprised that in the U.S., when there's a change of government, there are what? More than 3,000 jobs up for grabs. Nobody yes. ever says that a U.S. president is pursuing a jobs for the boys or girls agenda. Right. So it's not about the jobs for the boys agenda. It's the expectations of the office. If you or, get into office, mm -hmm. what does it mean for you? Or what does it add on to your life? Yeah. So is it power or wealth or you're going into the office to serve? And those are completely different things, you know, because if you're going into this office to truly serve, as the Minister of Local Government said, if you are appointing somebody to serve the people, why will people fight over wanting to come and serve people? 
you guys feel like you are coming in as a servant, and that should be, as a servant role, it should be a sacrifice. And if people are fighting over the opportunity to serve people, to sacrifice, it wouldn't be the case that people will fight over it. Unfortunately, we fight over it partly because we see that as a trophy that we would win. And then once you win that trophy, you are on to prosperity. You have power. You can drive across the streets with motorcades and then everybody will give you away. There's, so that kind of precedes when I had a local government minister say people are coming in to serve, I begged to differ. I don't think people see this as an office for service. Mm -hmm. And and just to square it up, I know that's that also connects with the gender issue you raised. Yes. Because there are some people who feel that for people who get nominated in the, to these roles, they get nominated because they contributed a lot to, to the, the party, party at the local level. Yes. And so why would you bypass somebody who has contributed a lot to the party and then give it to somebody else? And the question then becomes, is it a matter of being able to deliver for the people or being able to contribute to the political party? What can we do? to increase the number of women in these roles. Significantly, the Accra mayor nominated is a woman. Hopefully, when the assembly votes, she will get through. That's the first woman in yeah. a big you know, mayoral role we've seen. What can we do to push more women in? So, I mean, there are a couple of things. One, just making sure that the process of, especially given that the president has the power to nominate to prioritize that, to see that as a priority, just like you mentioned earlier on using quotas. Because this is an opportunity. It's not that people are voting to elect. This is an opportunity to really nominate people. And there's no reason to bypass women simply because of the fact that somebody or a guy has contributed more to the party. I think it's more about who in this constituency really cares about the constituency matters and can deliver for the people. And you should judge people based on that more primarily. And I, I know that, of course, contribution to the party has in different ways. It's either you, you're able to canvas vote, you're able to do other things that come in. And so just looking at the different variables that brings somebody up to a level where you can say they, they have contributed enough to the party to make sure that at least you nominate as many women as possible into this, into this world. Because this is just an opportunity to be able to do that. And the president has is the final, it's like having one voter for many people. Once he votes for you, you would go through. And so why not vote for women to take over? Currently, the um, approval processes are ongoing across the country in right. various assemblies. A few um, nominees have been rejected. Right. Yendi, Cape Coast. Yeah. Do you foresee many rejections ahead? I mean, what is your outlook for well, that? I think that will depend on the, the nominee and then, of course, the district composition. The question is, why are they being rejected? Is it really being rejected because the, the members of the assembly truly think they can't lead the districts? That's one thing. But giving the importance and relevance of the local government in development. I do think it makes it best for the districts to have their district chief executives in place sooner than later because we've already delayed and we need to get things done in, at the district level. So my hope is, even though I have no idea whether or not there'll be more rejections, my hope is that you know, people who have substantive DCs or MMDCs in place hopefully before the year runs out. Have you heard of perception of, um, for want of a better way of putting it, paying for these approvals? That some of the nominees have been accused of, you know, either paying monies to the members who are required to vote or engaging in acts that seek to influence their votes? So I haven't heard of this view at all. I, mm -hmm. I'd, I'm not surprised. It it would, it's, it's something typically that would happen? I'm not surprised that it mm -hmm. can happen because mm -hmm. it does seem like, just as we, started, we talked about earlier, it is about how much you're able to pay people off. And so if within the political party, the nomination process was such that people had to pay 
to win delegates. I can imagine that when it comes to the approval process, the immediate thing you think about is how can I pay these people off so that they vote for me? Or so that they approve my nomination yep. quickly. Right. Is that something we can ever eliminate? Because you hear the perception of cocoa season for party delegates, then the assembly members, maybe this is their chance to, to make some something money. before, because over after they approve this individual, hey, it's the next four years. You know, can we ever eliminate all of these? And if we can, how? Well, can we eliminate them? I'm not sure about that. We can make an effort to minimize it. And then minimizing it is just by making sure that the entire political process is run in a way that is open and transparent to everybody as opposed to limiting it. Because as long as you restrict it to smaller numbers, then the buy-in becomes an easy, you know. But if the numbers are large, obviously you can't buy off everyone. Yes. Or and larger. So, because the larger the numbers, and then of course in my research area, there are research that shows now, and once you have larger numbers, people will tend to provide more public goods. Because you're providing public goods because it goes to benefit everybody, and then you can please people in that process. Should we elect MMDCEs on a partisan level? Personally, no question about that. We should. Yes. Okay. And I say so, and I know I've made these arguments elsewhere, that if you want a government of the people, for the people, you really need to let them have control. Like they should determine who leads them. And I would be more thrilled to go back to my village in Zwarengo to go and vote for whoever becomes the district chief executive than to walk in there and then there's an appointee who doesn't even know who I am. His allegiance is elsewhere, not necessarily right. to the people. And so I am strongly in favor of the fact that people should be able to elect their MMDC. If we mean decentralization, if we mean democracy, we should go down that path. Yeah. Another issue that has generated a lot of discussion mm -hmm. is the government's decision to procure a new presidential jet for the country. Mm. Yeah, you're taking me down a different path. <laughs> okay, yes. And we've, at my station, TV3, we've spoken to some Ghanaians who feel that the costs, which we know is estimated at some hundred million dollars, it could be more, um, the procurement processes have started. Many feel that that's not the right way to apply resources at this point in time when COVID has ravaged the economy, uh, many people are out of jobs, times are hard. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I think this is a great question for the Afrobarometer for our next round of surveys, which will be starting soon. And I'm hoping that the Ghana team would add a question like this to their, their instrument to just ask people have their thoughts about this. Um, and I think this is where the value of the Afrobarometer comes in. Like, what are people saying about some of these things? And if we have the data on this, it does help people to make, this, you know, make some informed choices. Whether or not people will outright reject this or support the idea, it, would, it does provide the opportunity to hear what people say. Me, personally, it's, it just depends on where do their priorities lie. Like, is there, what is the sense of what happens in the country that, that today? And then where do the priorities lie? Because if a government in power, if you do something that signal that the priorities are misplaced, then you create a lot of disaff and disaffection in the con in, among your population. And so as a government, being compassionate, empathetic about the people's plight is as important as providing them with the services. And letting people know that the decisions and actions I take, I take them by taking into account the fact that I know how you feel, I know how you, your, your life living conditions are, and we make these decisions because of A, B, and C. And so in this particular instance where there is a heavy expenditure to be incurred, some kind of relationship that will allow people to see the value of it. Is there a, is there a reason for it? 
And if there's a valid reason for it, I don't think Ghanaians would object. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know, I have no idea, and I know that my living conditions are bad, I'm hoping that I'll get a job, I don't get a job, and I hear this somewhere that somebody's going to buy a jet, $100 million. Then it creates this sense that, okay, we have the resources, but you don't want to spend it on us. In terms of the presidential jet, there might be some who would argue that sometimes we're unfair to governments in the sense that one government, uh, probably, what, more than a decade ago, tried to or made the arrangements to procure a jet. And another government came and cancelled it. I mean, do you get a sense that sometimes if we have to take a decision, we should take it and move ahead? So that's the time. And that's the issue. Now the question is, is, is that the timing right mm -hmm. for, for us to do this? And just as you said, like, when, when these decisions are being made, the question is, in what ways do we see, or how do we think the public might react to this? And sometimes when, when things like this happen, it comes in the media and everybody reads or sees what is happening, and they don't have an explanation, a justification for why. So it was initiated, somebody canceled it, it's re, 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 you know, we started surfaced, again. Yeah. All, along all those processes, like, did we care to find out what people feel about it? And I think that is one concerning thing, because it looks like it is the leaders who are just deciding what they want to do. It's not necessarily about the people. And I think, you know, finding ways to close the loop, getting back to the people and figuring out how you can listen to them, hear them, and even if you have to explain why certain things are being done, explain it to them in a way that makes sense and that they can come along with you. All right. Yeah. Now, as part of some of the key issues happening in country, there's a lot of youth despondency. A lot of young people um, unsure about what the future looks right. like for them. Right. Right. And it sparked a movement, a spontaneous movement called Fix the Country mm -hmm. Movement. First, was this something waiting to happen? Well, I mean, I'm sure everybody knew that it was coming anyway, because throughout our service, we have documented over and over again people's concerns about unemployment. Unemployment is one of the things that ranks high. It is actually among the top. The top. The top. Among, and consistently so for Ghana, like unemployment remains at the top for the last several surveys that we've done. And, of course, if you disaggregate it by young people, you will see that young people are much, much more concerned about unemployment than even the older generation. And so, it that gives you the sense that these folks are really, really, you know, thinking about how they can secure jobs for themselves. What have we done wrong? I think it just boils down to providing the opportunities for both, you know, government to be able to expand in other parts of the country, and then secondly, for the private sector to, to thrive. And I say the private sector thriving because it is a private sector that actually provides the opportunities and jobs for young people. One challenge I've always had is the way we treat and handle Accra. Accra? Yes, because everything seems to be here. And now everybody is attracted. Accra is like a magnet, attracting everybody into the center of the city. And now, and our of course, population has grown significantly. Right. And that has implications. One, if the young people come here and the opportunities are very limited, what happens? You know, you have jobless young people roaming the streets. That is not good for the country. It just feels like it's a ticking time bomb for us. Which, which do you think we have more of? Jobless, unskilled young people or young people who've you know achieved a certain level of education tertiary for instance we have lots of graduate students i mean graduate students out there without jobs and so i wouldn't say it's just limited to a certain group of people it is all across the board and that is where the challenge is because whether you are skilled or well educated or not just accessing jobs is a challenge mm -hmm. and when i started talking about the congestion of christ how would we decongest Accra in a way that redistributes what we have in Accra across the country so that we would have different centers of attraction for people? So, for example, if Parliament were to sit in Brongahafa region, the airport was to move somewhere to the Volta region or Pram Pram somewhere, 
and then you move other big government offices outside of Accra to other regions. Then what you do is you create opportunity like once government systems begin to move, the private sector will begin to move with them. And, and the services and the value chain also, will also continue to move and people will, young people will be attracted to different centers. And so I mean, if you have young people congregating in the city centers, they are going to be congregating across the country. And that is where the opportunities arise. Because otherwise, it is not just the private sector that should go and put whatever it is in the Bronx Alpha region. It's government that's supposed to provide the infrastructure to facilitate that. And so if I want to do a large farm in the, the Bronx Alpha region, I'm hoping that the government would have the infrastructure in place for me to be able to do that. And I can employ more young people. And so in some ways, I just feel like it's gotten to a point that Accra needs to be decongested. Otherwise, both, I mean, the quality of life of people is likely to go down because everybody wakes up 5 a.m., you want to beat the traffic, you stay in the office until 9 p.m. because you want to beat the traffic, and you have no social life. Like, you don't interact. You, even going to visit somebody it just feels like a pain because you don't want to deal with the traffic. And you can imagine what type of quality of life are you going to live if that is the type of city you're living in. And if we continue to live everything in Accra, it's just going to continue to explode. And I think it will get to a point where we realize the quality of life here is not good. How about the skills of that young people are pursuing right. these days? Is it that we're not providing the guidance for young people to pursue skills in areas where that's where the next job is? Because when I started as a journalist almost two decades ago, I had no idea there would be a job called social media manager. But today there is, or a digital content developer, right. for instance, you know. Are we not providing the right guidance to young people so that we can project that in five years this is the next big area, so we need to direct young people there and the like? Right, so there are two things to look at. One, to think about how do we train people to occupy the job openings, the, the, to be able to meet some of the job demands today. And then to think about in the future what is likely to emerge. And if that is emerging, how do we train young people to take advantage of that? So if if in the future we know that there's going to be a lot of automation in certain areas. And so if you have self-driving cars all over the place or electric vehicles all over the place and gas stations are going to die off. And of course, if a young person is employed in the gas station, you know that 10 years time, it's likely that you won't have a job because they'll all be automated. And so thinking about that and say, okay, what other opportunities can we create for these young people to take advantage of? And I'm really excited about Ghanaian youth because of two things. One, they are really very tech savvy because many young people are dealing with, they know their technology so well. And technology is just going to drive the world whether we like it or not. The question is how do we prepare young people to take advantage of an emerging technology world? And secondly, just finance, the financial sector is becoming more and more technology based. And these young guys really have that tech savvy. And so if banking is going to go online, everything is going, you have a cashless society. How do we deal with that? And then how do we prepare the young people to take advantage of doing I mean, things in the IT sector that they can take advantage going forward? So for me, I, I do feel like in addition to training for the jobs of today, and of course, when you started it off, I was like, well, the jobs are not even there. So what are you really training for? Because you don't really have the opportunities. It's not that people are not qualified. There's not just the opportunity to do that. And that can create a disincentive to a training because if I'm going to train and I know that I know somebody who has an advanced degree in something and is not getting a job, it creates a disincentive for me to want to really do anything to invest in myself. But I do think, you know, training people for today's job, training people to take advantage of opportunities that are going to emerge, whether it is self-driving cars, it is anything that is technology-based, I think would be useful. Diversity. Diversity has become another issue that has dominated uh, the Ghanaian political discourse. Um, Achimoto School and the Attorney General's Department are headed back to the courts over um, the admission of a student who affirms a belief in Rastafarianism. And the Muslim community have also recently, just two days ago, filed another petition mm -hmm. with the National Peace Council. 
What are your thoughts about how we're managing that in the current you know, environment in Ghana? I think this is a topic that warrants a lot of discussion. Uh, I think that diversity is a strength and not a weakness. The challenge we have is probably twofold. A generational thing, a generational gap thing, because the younger generations and what they hope and aspire for and wishing that things will change in that direction seem to be resisted by the older generation who feel like things should remain the way they were when they were young, younger. Because, of course, we always talk of the good old days as if all the old days were always good. That is not the case. And so if you have that divide where things seem to be changing at a faster pace, and that is what the young people like, and the older generation feels like, you know, don't change too fast because we cannot cope with that change and we don't even want to see that change. That's where you see the clash. So there's um, a push-pull effect. We have older people in these leadership positions who are meant to, you know, provide the, the guidelines, legislative documents to implement, you know, rules that allow diversity. But we, we are not seeing that from the older generation, but the young people have adapted fast. That is, since so you have the young people adapting things that the older generation doesn't seem like they are willing to accept that. And I, just the example you gave for Achimota, you have rules that are in school books for decades, and you want to continue to enforce those rules. Nobody takes the time to step back and ask ourselves, do these rules really make sense? Or are they applicable? Uh, are they applicable in this again at this time? Era. <clears throat> okay, if we don't do that, then you continue to live in the past. It's like the sense that these are the rules that have been there, and I hear people say rules are rules. Rules are rules only if they are applicable in the modern times. If things have changed over time, you don't stick to all rules just because they are rules and they have to be implemented. And in that case, I mean, what has it got to do with if you live your hair long? Why would that impact your academic performance or your discipline? Coincidentally, the young man has been doing very well in school. But there are also those who say that this should go all the way to the Supreme Court so that there's a total finality on this matter, not just for people who are firm uh, to Rastafarianism, but for anyone else. What are your thoughts on that? I think diversity is a, a good thing, and we should aim to be more compassionate, more kind to other people, and accepting of everybody, regardless of who you are. I think whether you are a woman or man, whether you are tall, short, black, whatever. Because it is in that diversity that we find strength. And Ghana is a deeply religious country. We all profess to some kind of religion. And for all the religions I know, they all teach compassion. They all teach acceptance. They are teachers that we should be accommodating. And of course, the golden rule, treat others the way you want them to treat you. And so we have all of this, and we are deeply religious. But then when there's an issue of diversity, like minority groups, there's this sense that they should not be what they want to be. And I think that is where I see the contradiction. Who, who should be doing more? Is it just the government? Or we have all these other civil society institutions like the National Peace Council, for instance. Should they be you know, more determined to push this through? Because they keep talking about engagements, and these right. engagements have been going on for quite a long time. I think it just uh, takes everybody to think about what their own values are. Because if I do want to live by the principles and values of... Um, making sure that I treat people the way they treat me and making sure that I honor the values of kindness and then compassion and respect, which Ghanaians are known for because they always talk of the typical you know, Ghanaian hospitality and that Ghanaians are hospitable people. If we can't accept and embrace diversity in our own, whether or not a person speaks a different language, they are from a different region, it shouldn't matter. It is a human being, and we treat human beings as people and not think of them as that particular label, whether it is a physical appearance or it is the language you speak or the type of food you eat. That should not matter at all because inside all of us, we are deeply human, and we need to take that humanity as a basis for 
treating everybody with compassion and kindness. Now let's talk a bit about civil society in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Some have even pointed to a perception of a deliberate self-censorship of sorts. What's your reading of the situation? Yeah, I would probably take it at a higher level. If you talk of civil society or even just yes, academic researchers and independent advocates, the core thing is to live by your values and principles. As long as you stick to your principles and values, it, you would face criticism. I think that is where civil society can sometimes fail. Because if you have a certain principle about a particular subject or topic, it shouldn't matter what government is in power. Because if you flip-flop between an issue because there is a certain government in power and that you are, this is a, a position you take on one issue and you only change your view about that position because of a change in government. And I think that's where, as long as immediately you deviate from your own principle, then you shouldn't call yourself independent. You shouldn't call yourself civil society. Because a civil society organization would have a vision and a mission. And the mission is based on certain principles and values. And you have to live by those. The afro Brahmin, for example, we, we believe that African societies will thrive if African voices count in public policy. And that is basically what we seek to do, to bring people's voices into policy making. It's that is a principle we stand by and we want to be open and transparent about the process. We are very rigorous about our methodology. We, whatever we do is in the public domain. We don't hide anything. It's true right. that a lot of what you do is in the public domain, but isn't it the case that a lot of the survey questions also do change? And some may feel that the questions perception may be skewed at a certain point. So I remember, for instance, there was a question sometimes in the survey of uh, 2015 which asked about what Ghanaians felt <clears throat> about the government and whether it was moving in the right direction. Right. Then, the re then whatever the result is, it then points to, oh, maybe the, the current government is moving, percent a certain percentage say is moving in the wrong direction. And then that becomes like the big story. Right. But then <clears throat> in another year, where maybe there's a different government, you have a question that says, oh, are you ready to pay more taxes for development? And then maybe a certain percentage say, oh, yes, we are ready to pay. Then it's made to look like the questioning in your instrument at a certain time was meant was skewed in a certain way. And then yet another government has come in. It's looking more favorable to them. I mean, can you share with us how you then would deal with that? Well, let me just correct one impression. The question about the direction of the country has always been there throughout, from 1999 to date. And so where do you think your country is heading? We've never skipped that question. And so if you want to do the analysis on that, it always boils down to what is the debate at this time and time. And if we release the results, I do think the media picks on the questions and the topics that are relevant for today's debate. And that's the value of the Afrobarometer. We want our data to inform debates that are ongoing. And so if at a time that a government introduces taxation and we have a question about taxes, you can be sure that the media is going to get hit on that. It's more about the selection of the media than what Afrobarometer does <laughs> because we have a standardized instrument that we apply to all the 30 plus countries that we work in and we don't pick and choose questions based on, you know, the... The political environment of the time. Know. Sometimes we do select topics that are of importance. So, for example, these days there's a lot of debate about MMDCs in Ghana. You can be sure that the next round of the survey we will try to ask questions about MMDCs. Mm -hmm. And so that then, because we do that because we want to bring in people's voices into the debate. So we don't leave it just to people who have access to the media to talk but that the ordinary people can talk. And so, yes. But isn't are... there a real danger of not wanting to hurt whoever, whichever administration is in office? I remember the, there was a recent survey document release. I think it was a post-election survey report. And uh, the current administration tended to disagree with a good number of items, whilst the opposition said, oh, this vindicates our position. So isn't there always the danger that maybe as researchers, civil society, independent voices, you may buckle because 
You don't want to be seen to be favoring one person over the other, yet they're using the research to do that. We don't come in as being, because researchers don't think about favoring one person or the other. For the Afrobarometer in particular, we just want to project what people's views are. And whatever their views are is exactly what we report. Whether or not people interpret it in a way that is, a, whether they feel, see it is helpful to them or it is helpful to them, that is not our concern at all. As researchers, we provide data as independently as possible. People take it and interpret it. And if you think that these views are not favorable to you, you should ask yourself, why are they not favorable and can I do better? Mm -hmm. And if you think they are favorable to you, the question is, are they really favorable? And if you were in position, will you be able to um, implement or at least meet people's expectations as it is, you know, as mm -hmm. they express in the survey. And so we are impartial, we provide the data. It doesn't matter who is in government. If they don't favor the government, be it because that is what the people are saying. It's not us. It's been two decades of the Afrobarometer surveys undertaken in 30 African countries yeah. on a wide variety of topics. I understand it's, it's one of the most cited documents um, more than 8,000 times in, uh, if you look at what comes out from Africa. Right become right. one of the most referenced and quoted for African democracy, governance, politics, economics, and development. What's been the driver for such success? Um, well, two things. One, the initial leadership. So uh, Professor Gemma and his colleagues, Professors Michael Bart Bratton and uh, Bob Mattis, they initiated this and they went into this with their whole hearts. They really wanted to have an African survey network that can prove that opinion polling can be done in, in, in Africa and done well. And so it was more about they, are, they had a, they pouring their hearts into this. But beyond that, since 1999, we have been focused on setting core principles. And I'll mention them. First is independence, transparency, service to the public, rigor. And we make sure that our methodology is rigorous because the quality of your research depends on how rigorous your methodology is. But we are rigorous, but not sacrificing relevance. We still want the data to be relevant for public policy making. And so based on, it was, all of it is driven by the enthusiasm and commitment of the founding leaders and the fact that we operate on these principles of being open, transparent, rigorous, and then having the public in mind that we want to serve the public. You have an interesting background. Your undergrad degree is in computer science and statistics. Ah, remind me. <laughs> uh, you have an MA in economics and a doctorate in political science. That's really uh, from one end of the spectrum to the other. I would say some of it, um, maybe most of it is accidental and some of it is by choice. Um, by choice because I started off my academic studies largely from the pure sciences. Chose to do statistics at the University of Ghana and of course combined it with computer science. Economics was just curiosity. I was like, okay, there's a lot of application of mathematics and economics. I like mathematics. I don't know how it applies in economics and so I'm just going to try it out. And eventually I loved it because I did both econometrics, which is just purely mathematics, and then Health, status, uh, health economics, which is an area that I'm keenly interested in. But beyond that, of course, looking at economics, you can always realize that economics will only thrive when politics allow it to, to thrive. And so I wanted to find out the nexus between economics and politics. How do I understand politics to understand the economic system actually and operates under a, a political regime? And that's why I went to do political science. As a researcher, I mean, you have the statistical background, you have the economic background, then you have the political science background that gives you a broad view of how people see development. I mean, how important or significant is that to the work you do? So the work I do now, and especially looking forward into Afrobarometer's third decade, we have three key things that we prioritize. One is thinking about how we can support to build research capacity on the African continent. And the second thing is thinking about ways that we can actually fast track 
the way we produce and present our data to inform policy. Because data is only relevant for policy when it is timely. So how do we become more timely in the way we produce our evidence and inform policy? And the third piece is looking at regional leadership, so the Africa regional leadership, whether it is African Union or the sub-regional bodies like ECOWAS. How do we bring people's voices into those spaces as well? And for me, my background in all of what you've mentioned is what is helping us to shape what we can do. I can contribute to all of this. Of course, currently I sit in the management position and so much of my time spent on management issues, but I do have the intention and of course the like training to be able to support all of these areas. Whether it is doing rapid analysis, because that is my training, whether it, is, it comes to engagement with policymakers at any level of government, I do do that as well. And then thinking of how we can rapidly, you know, especially using technology. I have lived and worked in Silicon Valley for some time. I've done grant making and I've interacted with a lot of funders. And so in some ways, bringing the whole of my I should say the baggage of my academic work does help to inject into all of these areas. And I think when I came into Afrobarometer and I started developing this vision, it was all also driven by the fact that I have some of the background to be able to contribute and support and ensure that we can move the Afrobarometer to the next decade with all these elements. When you finally eventually decide to leave this role, what would you hope to have achieved or what do you want the legacy to be? Right, so the big legacy is two of them. One, that the Afrobarometer data continues to be relevant and used on the African continent. Previously, the data used to be used outside of Africa more than it, is, it was used here. So we're investing more to make sure that the data is used here to inform people. Really? Yes. Most of us journalists use it so much. And then, but then, outside there, they use it even much more than you do here. And so I think that is what we want to bring home. How do we bring that home more? The second component of it is, if by the time I'm leaving Afrobarometer, I feel like we have a strong cohort of people who can pull this data, analyze it, and use it for their own advocacy whether it is civil society, whether it is government researchers or parliamentary research associate or assistants, that they can, because its data is available, you can pull it, make an analysis, write a report out of it, and give it to somebody to say, this is the data, what the data says. If you are going to debate this policy, take this data and this is what the people are saying, and use that to inform. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to train a cohort of young people on the continent to be able to do that seamlessly. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph Asunka, for the very, very insightful you know, views about the Afrobarometer. And I hope that we'll get another chance to talk again. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Jeffra, for the opportunity. I'm really glad. And thank you from the whole Afrobarometer family to you. I know we appreciate the work you do and we value it. So we'll continue to engage with you in whatever way we can to contribute to your programming. Thank you. Now, we can't shake hands, but at least we can give each other an elbow bump. So There you go. All right. All right. Namaste. Thank you. Thank All you. right. All right. And you've been watching First Take with me, Jifa Bampo. I've been speaking to Dr. Joseph Asunka. He's the CEO of Afrobarometer. And he's been talking to us about research and how it's connected with all the issues relating to politics, economics, and development. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.